Welcome to Welcome to Welcome to, Welcome to the new cast hosted by Reva from New from New Life. Hey guys, um, oh, let me start over. Ooh, that was ugly. <laughs> okay. Hey guys, welcome to the new cast. This is episode five, I think. Um, uh, the new cast is an extension of newlife.ai, which is a social platform that transfers cultural data into digital assets. Um, today, we're going to talk with Preston Shumson Leach, who is a who is a huge um, proponent of the platform and a very regular member <laughs> member of the team as well as like a uh, guest on this show and today we're, and Preston is also a cultural commentator he's worked with dis v files um, I don't know you've done a lot of stuff you're like an yeah, art a director lot. a stylist a model but not a noddle um, he's and he's been at the at the precipices of, of the precipice of many uh, emerging movements in digital culture so um, today we're going to talk about um, his his uh, I'd say legacy is like an influencer of the one of the greatest Aww. trends of the of the tens, which was Normcore, and we're going to talk about Normcore because there was a New York Times article published recently discussing how sweatpants uh, accelerated the, the decline of the fashion industry or basically signaled the end of the fashion industry. But I've always been of the thought that sweatpants signaled a decline in not only industry but civilization. Carl Lagerfeld also said the same thing in the 80s, so I think it's completely true. And so we're going to talk about that and how maybe Normcore was like a precipice to this particular thing or like a precursor to this this faction. And uh, let's let's get started. Hey, Preston. Hi, Reva. How's it going? How's, it's it's going all right. We we're talking about the fact that we've had some weird uh, weird energy today, but we're getting through. We're getting through it. Yeah. We're totally getting through it. So. Tell us more about your history with Normcore. I think it was uh, in 2013 when um, Fiona Bryson wrote an article for, I believe, New York Magazine about Normcore. And uh, I remember hearing about The Office, uh, they needed people, examples of people who were in Normcore, and I had no idea what Normcore was. and. Uh, the article came out and uh, it was I was listed up there with like Dev Hines as you know who's Normcore and uh, I was still kind of confused to what Normcore was and then they kind of used uh, K-Hole's uh, you know concept of what Normcore is when they were uh, for, when they were forecasting it but I think what a lot of people don't realize is that when K-Hole keyed that neologism, it wasn't necessarily for, um, I mean, it, it didn't apply to necessarily fashion. It was a, a more of a cultural shift. And I think that's kind of like where we're going to be starting this conversation about, where it's not just a style, it was more about cultural in general. And uh, I didn't know I was normal core. I wasn't trying to be normal core. I thought I was just exhausted, lazy, <laughs> they wouldn't spend money. I lived in Chinatown. I was I just started dressing like the immigrants that lived there and what was available to me. And I thought, you know, at the time, people were very hyper materialistic and showing it. It was like with, you know, the influencer culture was becoming a thing and uh, just people feeling they had a right to luxury and, you know, the Kardashians, all that stuff. The the democratization of fashion and that's when I realized someone who worked in it and behind it at different levels and capacities that I really it was kind of awesome that I could still work in fashion and not have to get dressed up I could be on camera without having to like try to impress anyone and I literally woke up like that and rolled out of bed and that was my look and I was a norm core icon suddenly so eh. <laughs> and and that's kind of interesting I do th this idea of like this I just kind of rolled out of bed and got dressed and entered life is says a lot of, I think I, I think when I was reading the New York Times article or a study this idea of like sweatpants or a very casual clothing or this kind of 
just kind of disheveled, put together enough look. It's like, it, it was kind of a signal of the fact that we're kind of running out of time, I think, right? It's like, you run yeah. into the grocery store, running into live, you're kind of like, okay, I need to just blah, 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 and like go do my thing. I was very busy back like, then. Well, I later talked yeah. to Fiona Bryson. I was like, thank you for mentioning me. Why did you mention me at all? I didn't even know what this was. And she said, well, our editors told her that she mentioned Dev Hines and they said, well, we need another celebrity. And she was like, Preston? And like, great. So it was kind I of playing that. into that culture of celebrity culture and influence, even though I wasn't an influencer. Um, and I think that's when more so than what K-Hole had predicted as a cultural shift. I think that's when Bryson's article made it about an aesthetic in fashion and something that was tangible. Hmm. And the implications I, I do think, that is. I do think it's a tangible aesthetic. I mean, Normcore, when you were Normcore, oh, there's a bird of mine. What was that, 2013? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know that's good luck if you see a bird in your window. Just letting you guys know. Everybody oh, know that. there's two birds so, that are just having sex, right? Okay. <laughs> two, two. Okay. So we know what that means. <laughs> so, okay. Well, yeah, I, I do think it's the cultural implications of aesthetics. Like, when you were normcore, I don't know what I was doing when I was working at V-Files. When all that was happening, I don't, I don't think I was normcore. I remember you. Was. I remember I you. Yeah, uh, these... What was I... Yeah, these long silver Gray braids. braids. Like, like yeah. poetic justice braids. Oh. And you're kind of sporty, <laughs> but arty. Yeah, good, great style, great style. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> I didn't win best dressed in high school, but we'll see who gets the last Wow, one. I didn't get anything. <laughs> I didn't get anything in high school. I think I won most clumsy. Mm. All right, so, I, I didn't know expelled. that was like a thing, like a, oh gosh, okay, I mean, that's kind of fab, actually, that's pretty fab. Oh no. Okay, but yeah, I think the aesthetic, yeah, I think it was just like V-Files, like digital culture, I think this is like this, this, uh, I'd say, foray into the digital, like we started to like leave our like real worlds behind, yeah. like, the, like I always think about, I always think about like 2008, 2009, like when I was finishing high school and stuff and how, how my style was just like blah, like I would clash and wear like so many different colors and like layers and I was just like so fun and like blah, 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 because I, I was so invested in my reality, you know, it was like I had no choice. But did that have anything but to do with Tumblr? This, like, like were you being like super postmodern about it or? Whether you knew it or not. No, I didn't get into Tumblr until I was. I didn't get into Tumblr until after high school. I didn't know what like a Tumblr after. was till like, around this time, around 2013. Like I was. There's. A, I didn't have a presence online before 2012. Okay, so, I definitely yeah. had a presence online, but it wasn't like I was seeking like online culture. I was just online because my friends were right. there. You know, like I wasn't like doing anything. But I, I was so invested in my reality, like. I would go out, like I had a social life and like my internet persona, I did not have one, like that wasn't really a right. thing or anything. And then the more you make this departure from reality into your virtual, like into your virtual self, it seems like you kind of shed and put all that energy into this like alternative realm. Yeah, yeah. Like you, it's more personality than like style. Like I noticed like V-Files, like if you go to the V-Files office, the people who worked at V-Files, they were very, very interesting people, but it was a toned down nature about them. But all this personality was like focused on this like virtual stream. Right, right, yeah. They're definitely like do it for the gram and, types. And uh... That's the thing. Yeah, everything was, it was like if I got dressed, it was for the gram. Like it was like, and then you go home and put pajamas on it. And I guess I, <laughs> oh I didn't do that unless I was forced to wear like a sponsored brand. You know what I mean? I was like, what? Okay. Uh, I have to wear off white today for mm -hmm. the gram. Okay. It was my job, you know? So it yeah. was one of those things where I think I was kind of established in my own ways. I was already in my thirties when this was going on. So I was learning about the digital world and micro trends. And then, you know, I think a lot of times, especially with fashion, things were being accelerated, but they were trying to appropriate things that they felt were um, not mainstream or underground or subversive or, you know, out there. 
but when they started appropriating micro trends, it's almost as if as accelerated as that industry was in its appropriation, so were the trends because the trends were micro. They never really developed on the street. They actually became more of a thing online, in some ways. Which is that. I, I agree with you 100%. When I was reading this article, I was thinking about how I was looking at the dates for when the article when the articles about Normcore were released, and it was like it just Normcore never really ended. Like there people, there was a hype, a high snobiety or a hype beast article from 2019, literally yeah. last year. Like, so what is Normcore? And I was like, didn't we do this already? Like, do we not but, do I mean, this already? Even but like, I, this I just, year, <laughs> like people, felt, I've been reading a lot about Normcore what you um kind of mentioned earlier about during this lockdown like this the lockdown chic yeah whatever you want to call it you know it is lockdown chic and remember i sent you that quote um about how it like when was the lockdown my lockdown started on my birthday march 13th i was transported from on an evacuation bus back to prague from berlin <laughs> so i had to like I, was, I had a disinfectant in one hand and birthday cake in the other, and I was like, okay, this is my birthday, make it, make it work. And so, but after that, two days later, March 15th, there was there, this store, this brand, I forget the name of the brand in the article, he was like, usually on an average day, we sell about 46 pairs of sweats. On this day, March 15th, they sold 1,000 pairs of sweatpants. And it's like, I mean, it, well, as people are like, okay, if I'm gonna stay home, I guess I should be comfortable. I guess I should kind of like get into this lounge mood, blah, blah, blah. But me, I was literally in lockdown, like shopping. I was like, no, 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 no. Because once it's over, I'm going full Baroque. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's yeah. like, it's over. I'm not, there are like, so it's, it is like, it, I understood it for COVID, but it's like, if this is what the fashion industry becomes, it does showcase this like, this actual lack of fashion that we're just kind of being okay with it being in this like one size fits all right. kind of box of like tights, sweatpants, this utilitarian either either extremely shape focused gear or these like slouchy uh, silhouettes. And it's like where is the room? And, and and this is what we call fashion. So where is the room for like actual like artistry or right. craftsmanship? And what does that mean about the rest of right. the world? Well, right? I think when we talk about normcore it, it, it's it was whatever was available to people but it had a utilitarian ubiquitous aspect it was for it was people who weren't into fashion it was it aesthetically it's like sweatpants yeah. mom jeans you know what i mean and for something to be so ubiquitous and so common to become a distinct trend aesthetic hashtag to be appropriated uh, I think it's kind of interesting, and I think maybe more of us, because of this lockdown, are living like regular people. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's all kind of, like what do regular I mean, people you know, do? <laughs> manga mom, manga mom, and her mom jeans. You know what I mean? It's like sometimes I can't tell the difference between like a manga maybe. mom and like someone who works in art <laughs> and that's yeah. so sad to me I, I was having a conversation with one of my really well i consider her a good friend i hope she considers me a friend <laughs> katia <laughs> and she was like we we're talking because we're obsessed with like 2008 2009 like or even like earlier like yeah yeah yes karen O, like santa gold like when indie was really big and people were wearing like like colored skinny jeans and stuff like that when things were really really fun and powerful right before oh, the recession. late 2000s yeah and how the art i world, wasn't around <laughs> i was that and how i was living in paris at the time so i was working at an office so i wore i had like douchey clothes i wore heavyweight skinny jeans which everyone wore skinny it's europe and i wore like chom an expensive chambray shirt <laughs> It was just like well in America we were popping champagne, eating yeah, yeah, oysters, yeah, yeah. I was... and like wearing Rodarte. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, road it was art! So fun. <laughs> I remember road art because they were like, very road, road art. arty too. <laughs> yeah, it's very. It was very like over the top and like very sensual, like like really 
like yeah. devouring experience was like the whole energy and then recession and then boom it recalibrate and then somehow four years later you find yourself in this mode of people that this new industry is fostering the social this social industry is fostering and then you see this just like this like collapse almost of like the right. world of yesterday or like i don't know we kind of we kind of lost touch with fantasy well, I, I think, think. for me like personally my norm core icon status was kind of a fantasy it's like they made it into that and i was just doing me you know and then <laughs> it was weird because years later i would be in china or thailand or something and someone who's like thinks they're up to date on fashion would be like, hey bro i work in fashion and has anyone ever told you that you're very norm core um so it's like that was so three years ago and do you know who i am but uh and then people have approached me like, dude, you showed up in my uh, homework assignment. And I was like, at university, I was like, mm -hmm, oh, mm -hmm. okay. And, but the whole thing was, I mean, may, I think the fantasy was fabricated. And that's part of its appropriation to sell it back, mm -hmm. culture sells itself back. Um, yeah, and so- Yeah, good point. I just, I forgot what I was saying, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that was a really great point. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> I just found it to be what's it called? How high people are trying to go, like kind of outdo each other the normal court. Like, how high can your mom jeans go? You know what I mean? How ill fitting can you get that Seinfeld shirt to go? You know what I mean? And that's the thing. It's like I personally, I don't have a body type for sweatpants, like I don't, it just, I look beyond frumpy, I just, it just doesn't work for me. I, uh, things have to be tailored, right. it has, I, it's, just, it's just how I am. So, but I also think that says a lot about how we're able to design life for ourselves, like having tailored clothing, being able to afford to have like tailored clothing, a right. good suit, dressing up, going out and doing all these things. And, but then when you're kind of in this like monocosm of like, culture where it's like it's distinctly appropriate and also fashionable and trendy to be so dissuaded from pursuing a true sense right. of self like to right. like you know what i mean to just like completely alienate from i from from individuality for the sake of like right. looking like you're i also feel like right? since the lockdown i've been more <laughs> more interested in having clothes tailored even if my I get my sweatpants tailored. I'm more, I just bought some vintage, very Baroque Tom Ford Gucci loafers, velvet loafers off uh, eBay. And so I'm, and I'm noticing the way I dress is getting a lot more, <laughs> um, not extra, but not norm core. Like you're one, in, you're, you're one in a million kid. Not, you're just simply one of a million, you know? Yeah, you are one of the, like, I was talking to Katya once again about <laughs> icons, like, we were, we were talking about, like, who's iconic, like, I don't know anyone that I look at and I'm like, like, I, you know what my favorite music video is? It's Khalees' bossy music video. I love that music video because she's, like, claiming herself in such an audacious way. She has, like, poodles dyed, like, purple and green. She's, like, doing the splits in this, like, in this like French Renaissance building on like the on like the on like the Persian rug and she's just like I'm bossy. she's just like camera in her face flashing light like she's just like I'm here I'm me I'm Khalees and I'm iconic right. in like a really specific way not and it's that's tried to be replicated and reproduced but I've never seen it again and it's just a well done well well framed identity like display and I'm like when are we gonna see that again it's like every music video was like a, a meta modern re reignition of right. like what a music video was supposed to be it's like when are we gonna when are we gonna push the envelope a little forward and I, I think even in our entire life our entire lives or in art or in fashion or in every industry this post norm core well, identity it's, it's seems like to I'm individually going to be a light very similar to other people and it, it, it kind of 
mm-hmm. seems uh, contradictory, but it makes sense in some ways that people are putting effort mm-hmm. to blend in, which is different from the peer pressure to like of the pressure to feel like anyone. That's why maybe that's why they pick normcore. It's a low standard, so everyone can be accepted. But I hate that. That's the thing. Right. It, it glamorizes a low standard, in so my I'm opinion. So I'm going to ask a question. I personally you think it glamorizes a low standard. However you want. Like, but do you think that maybe this is reflective of our of culture in the West with um, everyone has a valid voice. We're all beautiful. We're all equal. We, you know, we're all talented and deserving. And even yes, you know, except being not. exceptional <laughs> and is not necessarily no. the end all for all. Um standard anymore I I don't really care what anyone says I don't mind sounding like a snob because I do believe that not everyone is beautiful not everyone will get ahead life is not fair and if you have certain skills and talents right. that give you an advantage you should use them if anything I really dislike this culture this pre-covid culture that was so stifling where you felt like you couldn't you had to exist in this box and exist in these ways that allowed the founders of these uh, platforms to to right. tell you the best way to represent I know. yourself. And that was And as someone awful. who's like 41 years I really old, I don't it. want, like, I'm not a dumb teenager. And to think that there's adults now, like, there's such individuals, they don't even know how to do, deal with it. They need someone to tell them or, like, sell something to them so they feel like they're getting a customized individual experience and that's what they identify as because and everyone is doing that i don't yeah and the thing is like, no. the reason why i was dressing kind of sloppily and slovenly and didn't really care because i didn't need to care it was before the norm core title was given to me i uh i said like, i don't need to care about the way i look i everyone could be dressed up doing all their thing and i could just still do my job and I'm actually getting awarded for being the only guy who didn't look like he took a shower. You know what I mean? That was my thing. And, but that was like you, be, if that is your, if that's your, if, is, is inoculatus a word? You know I love to make up words. Welcome to a new life. Um, <laughs> if that's a word, I feel like um, that was you being your true self. Like I personally don't, I remember myself in high school, I used to wear, I wear heels now, and I wore heels in high school. I did, I was, I, there was an entire year in high school, I never wore the same thing twice. Right. You never saw me wear the same thing twice, I was committed to this. <laughs> my, wow. My high school had a fashion magnet, I was completely obsessed with fashion, I was, that, that was my thing, like I was in it, you know, <laughs> and like, and I had this, not even a desire, but I didn't feel like my, self-expression wasn't necessarily something that felt rebellious I was just doing me because there were there, there were no points of reference or, or no pressures really I was just like oh this is what I want to try mm-hmm. today we'll see how it goes and I feel good in it moving on but then when you have like all of these like outward elements kind of like saying like no that's not gonna work or this is a this is how people don't evolve and things don't right. cycle out because you keep people in boxes or ideas in boxes. Like, no, what would have happened if Normcore actually grew into something else? If we just well, kind maybe of let that's it the process we're going in now, where course. people are selling you right? very ubiquitous <laughs> products and giving you the experience and selling you at the price where it feels like luxury. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, or what the quick. Yeah, you know I mean, so or maybe that's, that's what it is. It's actually <laughs> been abstracted yeah. from the actual aesthetic and product and object, and more about the experience of feeling individually uh, luxurious over something very, very common and ubiquitous, and everyone's doing it. It's so boring. Well, it's like I said with uh, Airbnb, they're (laughs) they're selling people can offer experiences (laughs) to people. It's like, go to a new country or city and ride a bike with some stranger dude, strange creep, who's not going to be a creep because it's tracked by Airbnb, to drink local wine, try local fare, and explore the city on a bike. It's like, 
wouldn't you do that? What else would you do otherwise if you visit us? Like, ugh. I, I don't... It's like, are people just... It's like, does just anyone... It's, it, it makes me wonder if people truly at this point are able to inculcate their own desires. Like, do you know what you want? Do you really know what you want? Are you okay with just like this, this person or this app or this thing like telling you what you should have? I'm just really confused at this point. <clears throat> I don't know. There's some philosophical... Uh, implications when you say that like do do humans do we really we might know not but there's want? definitely like no. an overlord kind of like pressing that issue upon us even further definitely right but also i think with propaganda or with capitalism or even branding there is an abstraction from what you actually need versus what this is true an abstraction i but there's also at the same time very little room for abstraction and in this particular post post norm core society there is no room for things that seem incapable of, of being quantified and that's an issue that's a huge issue right this is why couture no longer exists because right. you can't it's like well <laughs> like you know but i really like this um when i go to like developing countries i'll see the local rich kids like the cool rich kids of these developing places where they would dress normcore but have a really expensive pair of sunglasses. Amazing! <laughs> or like they'll put, girls will put a little bit of mascara on. Well, if you, yeah, I if, love it. If that's, I, mean, I love it, yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know much about that. I don't, I don't mean to sound cynical. I'm just passionate about fashion. I actually do have a passion for fashion. But also, those same kids, they might have a look that looks like they got at, like, the Salvation Army, but they'll be sure to flash that they have a Chanel wallet, and they didn't pay Salvation no. Army prices for it. And you can't tell by looking at it, but, but they know. But you also can tell so by looking at it. So they feel like they're in on I think there's a certain type something. of, once again, this tailoring aspect that makes a person, you can kind of tell when something is, like, out of necessity and when something is... Is, is tailored to a need or a, per, a preference. You can tell. Right. It's very, very there. It's very there. Right. But on the flip side, sometimes the authentic utilitarian pieces actually look Well, duh. Everybody knows this. <laughs> Everybody knows this. So, it's like... So maybe Normcore... It's not, there's nothing it's wrong with Normcore. Like, it's I don't know. just a signal... The post norm core. I actually kind of was me into out. norm core when it was a thing. Like I was there in New York. I thought it was cool. I was like, oh, this is really dope. I'm just. I guess the the point of this particular conversation we're having is like. I thought it was funny. I was like, sure. If it gives me like, you know, some cultural capital. Well, when I was in <laughs> grad school, I wrote this paper about about casual about where where uh casual wear comes from and it was actually introduced by college students because uh they don't have like you know it's introduced by people who are studying like philosophy or or some kind of inter intermediary theory program um as just like a different way of like life it was it was meant to be secular to colleges or non-secular to colleges or whatever that means sequitur that's what i'm saying sequitur to colleges and then it kind of trickled out into into mainstream which is why i think this it looks like it's from 1992 where it has this like collegiate feel to it norm core because it, that is its origin right. and it's kind of like so when are we gonna but it <laughs> It's like, when are we gonna become adults? Or like, I don't know, or, or go back to being children. It feels like we're just kind of stuck in this zone of like institutionalization and we haven't picked a side. But when you think about it, uh, you're, why does your college kid dress like that? Yeah. They're, they're broke and they don't really have a sense of style yet. You know, they're still becoming adults. And I think uh, the way a lot of people in their thirties in America, there's, they don't have these jobs, they don't have their careers. Starting a family and all that stuff in a very like planned, you know, middle class way is kind of like not possible. And a lot of them still live at home. You know what I mean? I They're disagree. still fighting with their mom. I'm disagreeing with you because I lived with my parents, I lived with my dad until I was in my like mid twenties. And I still, even if I was shopping at thrift stores or vintage stores or whatever, I still found a way to have a personal style. It's something that you have to want for yourself. But if you think this is what style is because you have not seen any, this is kind of like something that's just being constantly introduced, reintroduced to you, but it's like 
Right. There is no room for you to discover what your style is because those options aren't being presented to you anymore. You go to vintage stores because you're not seeing that in store. True, but also, <laughs> also you're being anecdotal. You sought out your uh, options. I would hope this conversation gives people the. But I would hope I this conversation gives people the ability to realize they have the capacity to do the same. The issue. Yeah, I think a lot of problem. people don't realize is that this they were saying is, yeah, the same it's thing. It's about this yeah. like coming into self is about realizing oh i don't have to do this i can go somewhere else and this is what new life is all about like oh this can still exist right. and there's nothing wrong with this particular thing but i can also try a new path or make some alternative choices right or i i like this but maybe i would like it slightly different yeah. or customized or let's, let's talk, talk about, about it, it let's know? open let's open panel and I don't think people are having that conversation. I think I think a lot of it is kind of the way the fashion industry was going. It kind of imploded with too many things happening, but no one talking. Mm -hmm. It's good to take a moment you know? of, of, what's it called, respite? A moment of respite to ask yourself, was that necessary? <laughs> was that worth it? <laughs> exactly. Well, the... Uh, the article in the New York Times about sweat sweatpants destroying fashion or had it had already started way before COVID. Uh, the one that uh, Irina yeah. Alexander wrote, she did mention that at one point they had to like keep making orders to department stores. Department the buyers kept yeah. demanding more. And it's like what season does it matter anymore? And they're making winter coats yeah. with no sleeves <laughs> and like winter boots that were toeless. It's just like what the fuck is Wait, going I love on a here? Boot, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do too. I think I it think looks cool. I think that was cool. kind of interesting. <laughs> but, but no, there was no talk of it. People just had, had to produce. produce. And they had to... And then I, I love the bit when she's talking about how it became like, in order to create this kind of, uh, this kind of like tailored aesthetic, people would start producing exclusives. But the exclusive was to just say like, oh, this has two sleeves? Let's just make it with one sleeve. And that's just ours. <laughs> so I'm like, I think we're the only ones doing that. <laughs> But I do remember that time, uh, Rowan Band of, Band of Outsiders. I think yeah. the, the one, the guy who created Entire World with, uh, with the coaxing of Gwyneth Paltrow Goop. Uh, during that time in the two thousands, I was like, I, I just need a black V neck, and I would go to like Barney's or opening ceremony, and they would have like a weird button or like a thingy Jamiki. It's like why. This is true, why too. Is so I used to complain bad. about this. Like, why can't... Especially in women's wear. It, in women's wear, it's difficult to just find a shirt. It's always, like, a shirt and, and it, then some. Yeah, and, it's like, worse. it's just too much. But then you have brands like Jill Sander. You have, like, La Mer does really great basics, I think. And then American Apparel was... I loved American Apparel, like, drama aside. You have, so we did... We have gaps still. I mean, there were these options, but then you want them in this, like... I wouldn't say luxury context, but this tailored context that, that we're discussing now. And then, right. um, but then that seemed like in order to have the luxury context, it had to be over tailored. It was like, oh, it's not about me. It's about the brand and like them having a signature. Where do right. I fit into this? So it was like, it, now we're trying to find this like balance, I think. Well, I think a lot of people in general, consumers, I think they want to stay up to date. <laughs> they find things interesting. They... They know what works for them, but they don't actually understand fashion. Yeah. Like, if you're going to spend a lot of money on, like, a high-end tailored piece or off-the-rack piece, they're kind of sold to you to be tailored. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the legs are always mm -hmm. long. And the darts aren't over. They keep it open for you to tailor it for yourself. I think a lot of people don't that. understand when that. I, mm -hmm. And they, that's why they kind of – they tend to go – you know, it's cheaper and it's faster. You get the look for less. It doesn't fit perfectly, but it fits good enough. And that's why people do um, like the Zara's. But and the it's also the, ex I, I mean, when I bought my first pair of acne jeans, they I was like, my legs are long, but these legs, whose legs are these? Like, I didn't understand it at all. <laughs> like, you have to get them tailored. I didn't know that. I just ended up, I think I did get them tailored, but I thought there was like a defect or I don't, I don't know what was going on with the jeans, whatever. I wasn't thinking about it, but like, um, but as I got older and I started to really think about or going to the tailor more often, it's such a like self care experience to go to the tailor. Like I, I personally find it very, yeah. very therapeutic and very relaxing and self affirming. I love it. It's super self affirming. It's like I wanna I wanna just 
pinch this in a little bit and like raise that hem and like cuff that shoulder and it's just like mm, it's just like this i'm trying to make this me and it's claiming i have like a fond memory of getting a dries van noten suit slash clearance on clearance on clearance, <laughs> on clearance from a small select shop and i was like oh they're struggling i want to buy this and it it fit enough but then once i got it tailored whole new world that's when i felt like an adult yeah. i felt like a man i felt sorry i'm binary i felt so am i <laughs> I, I i felt that i was a part of i felt like a human like a part of culture a part of interacting with the with Dries himself yeah. but also interacting with my turkish tailor interacting with a small business I was supporting, trying to keep them, doing my part to keep them afloat. And also they had small orders. So I was probably one of three people in New York City who had that suit, yeah. you know? And I still have that suit. And it's like, it, I think that's, yeah, when I'm not wearing that suit every day back then, I was in my pajamas. But I think, I think a lot of people don't have that uh, relationship with not only their clothes or their neighborhoods or their communities or with where their clothes are coming from or whatever. We can talk mm -hmm. about sustainability and all yeah, that stuff yeah. and <laughs> different models for that. But I think there's a consist consistent string there that there are consequences and they're going to come back for you. And I think maybe this post norm core thing, we're seeing that, we're experiencing that. And everyone's kind of scrambling to hold on to what they can. Yeah. Which is why I think, I don't know if we'll have like a resurgence of couture garments or, or extravagant fashion necessarily, but I think a lot of people in fashion are slowing down, especially like actual designers. I'm not saying like not big houses, I mean, big houses have a flurry of designers and they're still important as well, but like smaller brands who have the, who have the potential and capacity to produce like really, really, um, I'd say like timeless pieces are really kind of going back into themselves and saying like this industry is, comp well, when I was a designer, I felt like the industry completely robbed me of my creativity. It just, I was really sad. Yeah. I, I, my second or third collection, I was so unhappy. Op like opening yeah. ceremony was like beating, like like literally on my head. Like, when are we gonna get this dress? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'm stressed out. I have to. Can you make an exclusive? Can you add Can a you add an exclusive? on that? And I'm just like, I'm making a new collection, trying to get your orders out. I'm not quite sure how production works. And I don't also really want to produce this many of this thing, but it seems like that's what right. I have to do. And it it's a like creative people aren't necessarily machines. And, and I think post, post uh, norm core kind of also, I think, canonize this idea of like the mechanized self. Like this is the silhouette of the self in the most basic ubiquitous way and completely delineated right. from a, a creative per persona or, or personality. I mean, maybe it's safer that way too. If it's safer. This, like it's analogy. definitely safer. Because, I mean, <clears throat> who lost out? The designer. Who can't, who goes, who can't make their, uh, their meet their investments and then, you know, sell it on consignment? Or like, they're going to return it to you. It's like a loss that you have to cover. You know what but I mean? that's it's, also our own doing as well. We we contribute to the system that is cycling. The, the person way it who's is. creating the clothes and making it is is the one being shat on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it makes sense that that band of outsiders guy opened entire world. Like, I just do t-shirts. Yeah. I just do sweatshirts. And maybe that's what he wants to do now. If that is what makes him feel comfortable and confident, and like he's producing right. creative work and able to think clearly, then certainly, like I don't Good have an him. issue with that. Yeah, that's fab. Go off. Okay, I turned the light on. Okay. But I also believe like there should be enough room for like a Supriya Lili or or a like Commission New York or what's another really good brand I love or I'm trying to think like a small I can't think about many brands right now but those are two that popped into my mind who have the who who could really like because it's it's like we have this we have this obsession with growth but like why does every brand have to grow so much like why does that have right, to happen right. like it's so like. It's so... I mean, i just thinking, like, maybe there's so many talented people. There's so many designers. And maybe people... And plus, we can't communicate with each other. We we can't ship things out. People should cater to their customer directly. Yep. And, and produce locally. Communities can help from different... Your customer in different communities can help different communities interchangeably and mutually. You know? And I think that's what new life is kind of leaning on 
yeah. or actually is and i uh i love that i think i think in fashion people have been thinking this for a long time but totally. they just don't know how to, it's like why is everyone flying to milan during an outbreak to see clothes that they just don't so rihanna's there or you know what i mean it's just no one's gonna be buying all that gucci turban stuff and and why are there, why are there 80 90 100 looks 120 looks just to get as much shit I out there as possible I, I, I love it yes too. <laughs> but it is e extremely excessive it's excessive it's like it's almost like the Mar it's like a very Mar Marie Antoinette in the way it, it operates sometimes but, right um, I can see the collection on YouTube in like an hour like I don't need mm -hmm. to fly to Milan I don't need and to I also don't Milan. but it's also I don't need to get experience. Airbnb I don't need to get an Airbnb experience like I but I think no, fashion I people are the most experience oriented people on the planet like fashion people are like no, 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 it's not just about the outfit it's like the whole it's like the whole like cosmetic appearance it's like a, the whole thing the whole spectacle the whole shabam you know like well, it has think, to be all of that <laughs> I think a lot of fashion people creatives especially I think they understand archiving they understand historical context they understand mm -hmm. point of view they understand mm -hmm. appropriation they understand mm -hmm. Uh, reinterpretation, translation, and they also understand bringing it back, you know? Bringing it back, which is what I wanted to mention just now. It's like, I think what's really interesting is when we talk about normcore, I think normcore was like a gentrification of the self. We completely streamlined ourselves <laughs> into this, like, into this, like, uh, acceptable identity, right? right. And then right. anything else that seemed like it would be looked at with, with a slight bit of, like, awe, because in this kind of matrix, the social media matrix, we're all trying to, like, be a personality but also we don't want to stand out too much because we want to get likes so right. it kind of like how much can i streamline myself to get the likes while also being like me without getting canceled without getting canceled I, or dogs i've already been canceled Same i've been canceled do. once so yeah, i'm fine, fine. <laughs> uh, but also when we go back to 2013 or 2014 when it became like fashion and i remember at the time i was like looking at these high-end fashion magazines and they're dressed like me and i was like oh that's cool um i remember i would see some of the models from these editorials you'd be like you you know you stole my look and they'd be like totes uh <laughs> vogue had written something that said something to the effect of like normcore what is this well it's a look whatever they kind of copy and pasted what k-hole said and uh or what was k-hole was quoted saying in the new yorker or the new york magazine article and, uh, and they basically said, if you're young and good looking and thin, good for you. But for the rest of us, we are that mom <laughs> at Walmart. I mean, what do you want me to say? Like, it's like, they're not like, this is not reinventing the wheel. <laughs> I mean, this is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it, it does go back to what you said about this, this, this like flattening culture where like everyone is just. It, I was watching just Jordan B. Peterson thing and he said something like no you like no one has to accept you the way you are like nobody has to and you shouldn't either like you have all the tools to like elevate and like be better or something for the record and, and, um Reba admitted to watching Jordan Peterson I didn't <laughs> who cares sometimes he has like cool things to say I'm not about like whatever ugh Anyway, anyway, so like, anyway. I watch I him a lot, like, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like this this culture that is completely afraid of being criticized, which I think we're growing out of it, afraid of being criticized, afraid of like having a point of view, afraid of being right. like out there. Right. It's, it's coming to a close, however slowly, and we're starting to like, okay, if not... If I cared less about what people thought of me, what would I actually do? What meaning would I bring to the world? What purpose would I have? I wouldn't, if I wasn't under intense pressure to constantly normalize myself under these platforms and, and be like a feudal pawn of these industries, what would I do with the rest well, of my life? Well, I think life? it goes back to, uh, you know, how anyone has probably felt in their life, like pressure to fit in, but now it's kind of at a very low level. <laughs> and I think... I know, that's it's so what, mediocre. Oh my god. I think that's what makes it kind of interesting that I think there might be a reaction to it in a new, different way. Which I am excited about how young designers do it. I live in Tbilisi, Georgia. I see them doing it here. 
know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and I'm talking to some young designers in Milan or like, like people, Spain, like other places where the budget's not there. Resources are limited. Um, maybe the clothes are too outre, you know what I mean? So it'll be interesting to see how they evolve as these systems are kind of like not working. It's super fun right you now. You know what I mean? So I think it's I really was talking interesting. about I was, I, I agree with you 100%. I was talking to a friend. I was like, I know it's August and everyone's probably on holiday, but like, I'm ready to see new work. I'm ready to see this like post COVID like design process. What's happening? Like, I'm so like juiced for the next phase. <laughs> like, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And I'm, I've never been so excited about fashion. I feel like I'm the most excited about fashion that I've been in like years. I know. I haven't even seen anything <laughs> yet. So I'm kind of like, ooh, ooh. Ah, ah, <laughs> I know. Ah, ah, ah. I know. It's like, I'm like watching the popcorn pop, but if the kernels haven't popped yet, you're just kind of like you hear something like it's spinning. You know, you're like, you're it's, like, spinning. <laughs> it's spinning. It's spinning. Yeah, it's churning. The butter is churning, but there's no butter yet. Yeah, yeah. Or what is it? The curd the is churning. I don't know. I'm trying to make a. I'm bad at analogies. Tofu. Let's move on. Tofu. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we've got. This has been a really fun. This is episode. really good. Yeah. Um. Thank you guys. Yeah, I had a good time. Thanks for watching this episode of the new cast. And we're going to be doing, Preston and I are going to try to do episodes more yeah. often. Um, I hope you guys like this show. And we'll keep talking about fashion and cute stuff. Welcome to, welcome to, bye guys. Well, 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 welcome to the new cast, <laughs> hosted by Reva, 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 Reva. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. Nope.